one friend who is a very successful businessman gave me a very good advice. He told me that, Kakiet, you should start running and that helps you clear your mind. One company that aims to set itself apart from the competition is Fastspeed. You can be in your office, you mm. can be at home, and you can expect the same kind of fare from your favourite hawker centre, for yeah, instance. It is indeed making me hungry, right? <laughs> it starts off with a lot of things cluttered on my mind. It's an impossible task. Why do you want to give up your comfort zone and step into something that is totally new? We are burning our money. So it's either we will continue, if not, the whole company will close down. After the run, you realise that it just looks different. And those things that you think are very big problems suddenly seems like, it's OK, it's not going to kill you. My dad, he was uh, an employee with the SBS then. Towards uh, retirement, um, after 55 years old, he went full-time to run a Kitty Ride business. And it wasn't just Kitty Rides. My daddy had a whole breath of like little things that he was selling from detergents at home to even a bookstore and also a, a little food store as well in his early days. My mom is a homemaker. She brought up the three kids at home, took very good care of us. And she is more conservative, quite different from my dad and my brother, but it brings a very good balance to the family. My brother and elder sister, they are a lot older than me, so for a large part of my studying life, I was the only child at home with them. Kakiet, he loves to eat, so every time when we have our family dinners, we will make sure that you know we order enough and uh, with enough quantities, enough varieties. When I was young, when I was a teenager, wherever I go to, let's say in a restaurant, I'll look at the business, I'll look at the number of people queuing in the restaurant, I'll look at over lunchtime how many turnarounds they have. And all this intrigues me and I'll start to think, is this going to make money? I don't know exactly why, but I guess this huge sense of curiosity, wanting to know how this entrepreneur makes it, how this business attracts customer, how this business does better than the other, is something that, that draws my interest. When Kakiet's brother was in his 30s, he secured a franchise to distribute organic soaps in Singapore. I would think that both Kakiet's brother and his father have got great influence on him. So the, he also decided that you know, he, he himself also wants to give it a go. With economic growth slowing, Singapore's financial sector Last must look February, for Last February, Singapore Airlines froze cabin crew recruitment because of the economic downturn. I graduated from NTU, Banking and Finance, in 2008. And that was actually the worst year to graduate. Suddenly, all the good jobs in banks disappeared. But I was very blessed that I chanced upon an opportunity at the Singapore Economic Development Board, um, EDB. I think being elder parents, they see government jobs as something that is stable. So they were very happy for me. At least I landed the job in very bad times. I was based in Beijing looking at the North China market, and I also covered the um, South Korea market as well. After my stint in, in China, I came back to Singapore. I was looking at building a new industry in Singapore, and I was exposed to the Lean Business Startup methodology, and I was excited about it. I liked the idea of it. To me, the Lean Business Startup is a very scientific and methodical process to allow me to carry out entrepreneurship in a less risky way. For example, if you feel that you can make the best sandwich and everybody will want to buy your sandwich, the Lean methodology tells you that maybe you should start with one or two sandwich first and maybe start with a push cut first. And if the sandwich sells, you start expanding the range. The customer feedback may lead you to develop new flavours or you might realise that actually my lemonade sells better than my sandwich and end up with a business selling the best lemonade in town rather than just sandwiches. 
I was 33 years old. I love my job. I love the impact it has on the society. However, I look at myself and I start to think about what am I going to do at 40 years old? Are my skill sets going to fit the new economy? And that's when I took a hard decision to think seriously about quitting a job to do something different. He came out with his own business proposal and shared with his brother and sister and as well as myself. It was quite a well thought through one, um, at least on paper. We felt that on the whole, um, he is taking a calculated risk at what he's doing. So we were all quite supportive of him. When I told people around me that, hey, I'm going to quit my job, some of my friends will come to me and tell me, hey, bro, you really have guts. So when I got a $10,000 grant, from NTU Entrepreneurship Centre. That was a good validation and I was quite happy about it and that gave me a strong boost of confidence. I realised that, hey, I need to pick up everything from programming, talking to hawkers, engaging customers and also to, to manage and run a team of young, uh, highly motivated um, people. So right after I left my job, I built a simple web portal to allow me to actually sell breakfast to consumer. One day right before I opened shop, I was giving out flyers at Jaywalk to tell people this is a new service, they can order online and they can pay online and pick up breakfast from me at the distribution point they'll be passing by every day. The next day when I started the business, nice, I actually got four orders. When I first uh, come on board Fastly at that point of time, Kaket has just started, so like we were still giving out flyers while at the same time we were distributing the breakfast meals. I realised that having humans to give out meals is not effective. And if I'm going to scale it up to have, let's say, 500 distribution points in Singapore, doesn't mean that I'm going to hire 500 people. So I started looking at the different types of vending machines that I could use as a distribution point to bring about more efficiency. There was this lady who, who actually bought meals from me every single day. She was sharing that in the business park that she was working at, she's very sick and tired of that food court option she had there. So when I offered breakfast items, she was actually keeping them until lunchtime whereby she'll microwave the food and have it warm. That's when I realised that, hey, that's a huge opportunity to sell food to tenants in business parks who have a lack of variety as a key pain point. So back then, after our first prototype machine was set up, we noted that One North uh, probably is a good location given the high density of business parks over there. I believe at the point of time, there were quite a number of competition, quite a number of players in the whole scene, but none of them were actually using hot lockers as an endpoint for delivery collection. We had an e-commerce system, so people will go onto the Fastbee website and purchase the food for the next day. And then at 10.30 a.m. in the morning, we will consolidate all these orders, which will actually be sent directly to our mobile phone using a chatbot. All the orders will go directly to the hawkers, so they can actually prepare even before our delivery man go down to them. The delivery man will bring all this food directly to our vending machines and they will just place all these single food items directly into the individual hot lockers. I see the Fast B business model as a way to change the way people obtain their food every day. So after the very first machine was rolled out, people were talking about this service and they felt that this could be a model of the future for food delivery. The food delivery players were all focused and concentrated at CBD and I was pretty much the first guy to actually go into business parks and I saw huge opportunities. I have a chance to win the business park uh, food delivery game. In your office, you can be at home and you can expect the same kind of fare from your favourite hawker centre. 
when we were getting food from famous brands, uh, for example, popular chicken rice from Chinatown. Within the first few hours when the food were available online, they were very quickly sold out. There was a lot of hype, be it Facebook or like even uh, Vulcan Post uh, did, did an article on us. I mean, because it's such an innovative concept that naturally helped us to grow our business as well. When Fastbeat was at its peak, we had uh, three full-timers and we had uh, support from the technical team. We had a team of 10 delivery drivers who would help us on a rotational basis. That show on TV was the opportunity for me to bring my mom, my dad and everyone together to let them know what I'm doing and it's actually getting the right attention. So the whole family gathered together and we make sure that mom was there. That was a surreal moment. My mom didn't really give me any feedback or say anything um, while watching the show. One of the worst days that I can remember was when everything went wrong. So we had to go to a new hawker centre because the regular ones that we go to, they were actually closed for washing. Some of the items which uh, we thought is on their menu uh, weren't available for sale. We actually had to run to other hawker centres and hope that there is a similar item for sale. And on that day, our drivers actually didn't turn up for work. So I was running, I was delivering food, I was trying to repair a machine, I was talking to my staff, I was talking to customers, and I was trying to solve everything at one go. Suddenly I saw a message from my mom. And she told me, Kakiet, have you had your dinner? You look troubled this morning. Are things all right now? Mom will never give you a hug or give you a kiss and reminding him to eat in a very subtle way that uh, she is supportive after all. That brought me to tears and that recognition that my mom knows that I, I, I'm not playing a fool out there. I was doing serious work. So there were a lot of challenges from getting the hawkers to work with us and then to getting the manpower to deliver food as well. Fastbee actually hires freelance drivers for our delivery operations. Some of these uh, delivery drivers are not that reliable. And we were unable to quickly find a new driver to deliver the food items to the specific machine. So it is either Kaki or Derek who had to physically go down to the individual stores to pick up the deliveries. We realised that actually we do need like good, uh, reliable drivers who really knows the ins and outs of a business in terms of uh, teaching them how to operate the machines, how do they read the orders for the hawkers. Sometimes the hawkers, they are so busy that they somehow gave like wrong orders. Sometimes a certain cable in the machine got tripped or snapped off and the lockers cannot be opened customers would get kind of frustrated because this issue usually takes about a few hours, which by then, when the issue is fixed, it's probably past lunch hours. We sat down as a team, we looked through all the different processes, and we started to build a lot of new IT tools to help us manage this whole process better. Of all these problems we faced at Fastbee, there was this one particular problem that could close down our business. An uh, Indian investor required us to reach 10 machines within six months. We had only nine machines and we needed the 10th machine before the investor could provide us with the amount of funding. We couldn't find the 10th location and we were running out of money. I remember it was a Wednesday night. I was already thinking that, okay, we are not going to make this happen. And the next day, I, I probably couldn't make payday. And I probably have to dissolve the company after. When I did Fast B, my vision was to change the way people obtain their food every day. 
in a journey in this startup business while trying to prove that this concept works, I had a lot of convincing to do. I have to convince the hawkers. I have to explain to customers when things don't go their way. I have to convince my staff who are not very well paid to, to be motivated. I was not getting a salary and I was also putting a lot of my own savings into it. And all this makes me always wonder, like, why am I doing this? One year into the business, he had some difficulties getting funding, so we could see that he was also losing weight because he was skipping meals, going to meetings and trying to meet his business um, timelines. In October 2017, the investor needed us to ensure that we had 10 machines by then. So that was the last day. It was a near-death moment. On Thursday morning, I saw an email from the landlord, which finally said that, OK, they could let us deploy the machine. It was quite a close shave for us, and it just means that we, we could continue uh, functioning as normal well, until the next phase of funding comes in. The money comes in tranches. So we got the first $50,000 in already, and we had about six months um, runway to use that money. We have to hit certain KPIs, and the KPI being that we need to deploy 10 machines uh, out in the market. So our, our time was very tight. I had to throw in about $10,000 a month to pay my staff, to get suppliers, cash flow in place. And every time before I sleep, when I know that the next day is going to be a payday, that night is going to be a sleepless night. We volunteered to like take low pay for the time being, just to keep the business sustainable. The technical team offered their assistance to Carcat at a much uh, lower cost as compared to their other projects on hand. It, it helped a lot because our business cost, most of it comes from uh, operating the machines themselves. The team members know that finances were very tough. In fact, it was like a tough war and they know that it's now or never and they were needed together. Fastly managed to sustain for another four to five months. We were working very hard on various proposals to keep Fastly sustainable in the long run. We were talking to a lot of investors, but it didn't work out. So the last one has strategic reasons to, to make an investment in my company. But that decision dragged for three, four months. And it was then D-Day, which I told that company that like, hey, if you guys are not going to make a decision on this day, um, it's going to be the end for the company. I think all of us were already prepared for it. It was either a make it or break it session. In the month of August, we already stopped operations, only waiting for one call, which is if the next investment will come in. I remember vividly the day the investor called. Um, it was actually National Day Eve. And he called at night at 10 p.m to tell me that the deal is not getting through. Now I had to make the phone call to tell my employees, and it was a difficult phone call. I mean, after all these years or months of efforts, it's just back to ground zero. I was having a National Day celebrations in uh, my army, and I received a notification within the FASB group chat. So when I took out, uh, I just realised that uh, everything is over. And emotions are expected to be high for both participants and spectators come the 9th of August. At that moment, reality finally set in that, ouch, it's the end of that two-year journey. Within minutes, and the messages came one after another. Friends start showing concerns. They send me messages to tell me that it's all right and everything. And at that moment, I realised that, oh my God, this is real. To us, he's always been a fighter. We knew that you know, he will come back again. The first day of work, I reached office at 8.30 a.m. And I got out of the car. I looked at the SETS logo. Then, wow, this is a new journey. This is the start of a new beginning. 
Well, back to corporate attire again. Came into office and people didn't even know that like there's a new employee coming. They had no desk for me. They had no idea what I'm supposed to do. It was a new role that was created. I remember my first meeting with my boss, Thomas. I was actually one hour late. I felt horrible. I think he forgot about the appointment and he said, Hey Thomas, I'm, I'm running late. Could you just wait for me? The ensuing conversation was quite interesting. We talk about how companies in Singapore need to constantly look at transforming themselves before they get disrupted by startups and big tech companies out there. And we both got very excited about the potential to work together to also help um, sets build new revenue streams. He looks at things a little bit different from our perspective, being agile, being dynamic, and how to go to market in a fast way. Despite the failures, right, he's still quite upbeat about this. So I thought, that's the kind of characteristics I would like to introduce into our innovation journey. We all know that startups are not easy, so it's a matter of the learnings that he get out of it. The money that he put into the business is like um, taking a real-life MBA. I think um, it's worth it. In June 2018, I took a short trip to climb Mount Kinabalu. When you're up there, you're climbing, you're not looking at your phone. You're not talking to um, people about your business. You're just thinking about the next step, one step at a time to reach the top of the mountain. And that made me realise that failure may not be the end of life. There's so much more to go for. As Jeff Bezos said, when you are 80 years old and you look back in life, the only regrets you have are about the things that you never did. I never regretted spending that two years running entrepreneurship. I learned so much and not just the skill sets, not just about Lean Startup. I learned what I'm driven by, I know what I'm passionate about, and I know what I can do, and I know what I need to work on. And I hope this gives me the ability to run this marathon even further 